G'day fans of the GBA, it is The Verd back with you again and welcome here to another week of Pivotal Moments. Of course I'm not alone, I'm joined by my lovely co-host Bill. G'day, my name is Bill Stanish, hoping you guys are having a great day so far. Now, again, if you guys aren't too sure about what Pivotal Moments are, we did explain it really well in our week 2 video, so if you'd like to go check it out. But quick little summary, basically we look at the uh, best plays and best moments of prep and you know whatnot from the coaches and we kind of talk about how they were pivotal in the game, but yeah. So without further ado, we'll just get right into it, and I believe you, Verda, are taking over the first game. Oh, hell yeah. All right, so the first game we have this week was between the Borussia Donfan and the Tampa Bay Luxrays. Mono continuing that really solid start to his season with a big 2-0 victory. Probably the biggest moment of this game. It was pretty much like a straightforward game back and forth, but one really nice play on Lars's part was the Kebia Berry Primarina, which was able to lift the gunk shot from the Greninja and actually revenge kill it in the process. It was really nice from Lars. It allowed Primarina to be a really solid ninja check and got rid of a huge threat on Mono's team. Next up in the Torcats vs Scizors match, Duncan, Duncan had a few haxy things happen to him, uh, being the missing a medium mash on turn 1 against the Claydol, and a crit aqua jet on his Landorus, and finally a low roll icy wind on the Thunderous with his Keldeo. But besides this sort of hacks, it was also a very straightforward game. Now the big thing about that last bit of hacks, the Icy Wind being a low roll, was it allowed the Thunderous to get off a Rain Dance before it died, which meant that Azumarill could go quite safely for the Aqua Jet to kill Keldeo, whereas if it didn't have the Rain, Aqua Jet might not have killed, and Keldeo did have a chance to kill Azumarill, I believe, with a crit from there, so it did basically seal the win there for Chimp. If it didn't happen, maybe there was a slight chance for Duncan. In the next game, we have the San Francisco Arcaninas versus the Pittsburgh Piratators. There was a few interesting sacks in this game that both had different reasons to happening. For example, on top, for example, on top side of the field, on turn three, he sacks his Tapu Koko to a Choice Scarf Miensha. Tapu Koko, of course, was a huge threat on his team, and so him not seeing the fairly obvious Choice Scarf lost him a huge momentum in that game. The other one to mention that I thought was really nice, um, kind of. It was one of those moments where you kind of think long term, and George was thinking long term, he knew that his Mew didn't have a way to hit Minior, so he purposely tried to sack it to prevent Minior from coming in for free, getting off a Shell Smash, and potentially just reverse sweeping George's team. So that was really smart on George's part to know that um, sacking Mew there was better in the long run for the game, and obviously worked out in his favour as he was able to clean up late game. For sure. In the next game we have St. Louis Rampados versus the Florida Gators. A few things I want to highlight on Gators side would be, he never really got the opportunity to set his webs up. Of course, he was scared of the uh, Delmines being able to spin them away, but if the Gators were able to play around the Ghost, he may have been able to use it to his advantage. One other thing we want to mention is he played pretty awfully around the Delmise. At one point when it was Terrakion versus Diggersby, he decided to go for an Ice Punch predicting the Delmise to come in, which didn't actually happen, and then he lost his Dig Diggersby in the result. Another big thing to get to highlight, because I mean, I have never seen such <laughs> amazing Stone Edge luck in my life. Dan, aka A Drive, hit seven consecutive Stone Edges. That is freaking insane. Like, I can barely hit one. Stone Edge when I'm on competitive Pokemon. So the fact that he was able to hit seven consecutively is is wild. Definitely a pivotal moment because that kind of like that that's literally his shiny luck right there. It's insane, man. It's insane. Truly amazing luck on that side. Next game we have the New Orleans Pelopers versus the Alola Athletic. On Callum's team he said he didn't really have much to deal with Milotic as he didn't bring his Rotom and maybe if he did bring his Rotom the game may have turned out differently but the Milotic was a true reckoning for him and that I believe you're going to talk about it. Yeah, it was just a set that I guess maybe Callum didn't expect because he had Rotom, but it was such a really strong one with the Flame Orb, it basically meant that its Marvel Scale was instantly activated. Didn't really mind if it got knocked off later on, but basically Marvel Scale will like, I believe, double your defense when you're burned or it gives it 1.5 boost. Regardless, it made my loading this massive wall that uh, a lot of Callum's team couldn't break through and it basically just systematically broke Callum's team down. I'm pretty sure John didn't actually use that many Pokemon in this match just because my Lotic soloed so much of Callum's team. So. Unfortunate lack of prep on Callum's part, but just a fantastic set by John, um, which took advantage of the situation really nicely. The next game we have the Sharpedos versus the Giantes. Tom was able to make some great predictions early on, catching the Tapu Fini with a Sludge Wave, but the main point I want to highlight is the dual Trace Mons he brought to counter the Intimidate Mons that Geo's Geo had. 
While Geo only brought one to the game, it still deemed to be very effective as the Porygon 2 was able to efficiently wall the Gyarados. Another thing to mention with that is it also scouted to see that it was actually an Iron Fist Conkelda, not a Guts Conkelda, so it allowed Tom to play accordingly around that too. But the other big thing I want to talk about, obviously, uh, Tom talked about it at length in the battle, was the fact that Hitmonlee went in on Geo's team. People were saying that Hitmonlee uh, can't take hits. Well, it swallowed two... It, it, it took hits for days, man. It took a hit from Heliolus. It took a hit from Gengar, both of which have very respectable over 100 special attack stats and was able to kill them both. So, for all those people out there saying Hitmonlee is not bulky and can't do stuff, Tom easily proved them wrong with a fantastic display this week. Fantastically named uh, Hitmonlee as well, not offensive. Next up we have the Steelwings versus the Jasmines match. In this game we had a face off between a Scarf Caballion and a Spec Swallow. After the Swallow was able to take out Crimson Slowbro, he knew that it had to go. He goes for the Volt Switch as Swallow stays in, but is able to live on four. This allows Coop to get rid of the Serena, which was the only thing stopping his Breloom from winning the game. This wins Coop of the game 1-0. Yeah, that was a huge moment. And the last match we're going to talk about is between the San Diego Chim Chargers and the Milwaukee Souls Bucks. And I guess the big moment here was it, it kind of revolves around the whole premise of Trick Room in this game. So MV, not sure if it was exactly for Trick Room, but inadvertently because he had a Curse Alolan Muck, it was able to counter Steve's, oh, sorry, Battler X's uh, Trick Room um, ability. And it was able to actually counter sweep him. So that was kind of rough for Steve, but I mean... At the same time, Steve kind of put all his eggs in one basket with Trick Room. He kind of risked it for the biscuit, and it didn't really pan out for him. It was obviously a risk to take, but Envy's really good prep of Alola Muck, and maybe Steve's over prep of Trick Room were the big factors in this game. I would definitely agree with that. He decided in the game, this is how I'm going to win, and there's nothing stopping me. So once he, uh, once Envy revealed the curse Muck, he was like, well, what can I do now? I've lost it. But either way, a fantastic match on both sides. So basically, guys, now what we're going to do again is get you guys at home to vote for your favorite pivotal moment of the week. Now, last week's winner, with a whopping amount of votes, like ridiculous amount of votes, the winner was the Raw Tyranitar and Raw Dratagon used by the Alola Athletic in their match against the Milwaukee Source Bucks. And as well as voting for which you think the most pivotal moment this week was, we want you guys to vote for which was the most pivotal out of the Week 1 winner and the Week 2 winner. So, so was the misclick with the Volcarona more pivotal, or was the Raw with the Tyranitar and Dratagon more pivotal? You let us know in the survey down below and in the comments if you feel so, like you need to. Anyway guys, that's going to do it for Pivotal Moments this week. We really hope you have enjoyed. If you have, like this video, comment down below, and also don't forget to subscribe to the GBA channel, as we always do appreciate new subscribers. But for now, I think that's going to do it for us. Uh, this is Verd and Bill, and um, yeah, adios. Have a good one.